So yeah, what, what's your view about de-implementation yeah. and, and, and safety for people to make mistakes? Um, so de-implementation is really important. Uh, the more you can simplify the system. So the more things you take out of the system, the more you're simplifying that system, the, the more simpler system will be safer in the presence of change or dy dynamic situations. So, so the more the more um, the more you add to the system, the more complex it is. The more likely it's it's going to fail, and the more likely it's going to fail in an unexpected way. So, by by de-implementing and making the system uh, simpler, you're actually making it safer, and you're making it more resilient to to any unexpected event. Um, and we know that theoretically. Um, but it's very difficult to get people to accept it uh, in the real world um, because people think that um, people are still of the of the um, way of understanding safety and the way we used to understand it in probably the 90s and early 2000s where this was uh, this idea of a cascade of errors, you know, so that so they almost like a Swiss cheese, you know, with holes in the different layers and you get a cascade of errors through the holes and look there, you would get your event at the other end. And the way to stop that is you put barriers into the different levels to stop that cascade. Um, now we know that's not really how systems work. Uh, systems don't fail in a linear way like that. Um, systems fail in unexpected and complex ways. And the more barriers that you put in the system, uh, the more complex it is and the more likely it is to fail in an unexpected way. Um, so I could give you an example from aviation just to because it's it's a very simple one and easy to understand. So uh, the German wings accident that happened uh, back in the, I don't know how long ago it was, a decade and a half ago, um, where, where the pilot uh, suicided and, and managed to lock um, everybody out of the cockpit um, and they couldn't get in to stop to stop this person doing that. And the reason was was because that locking of the cockpit was a barrier that was put in place as a result of 9/11 to stop a terrorist getting into the cockpit. So, so you know, a, a person who thinks in a linear way would think, okay, we don't want terrorists to get into the cockpit. We'll make it lockable, and you can't get in without the pilot actually physically unlocking it and letting you in. A complex system, well, sure, it won't let the terrorists into the cockpit, but it also won't let the flight stewards in there to stop the pilot if they're doing something. So, so it, you know that, and you get the same thing happening in healthcare, where you get lots and lots of layers in to stop things that retrospectively have happened in the past and yeah it might stop that retrospective thing from ever happening again but there's all these other inadvertent consequences of other things then happening yeah and I, I I had some uh, doctors on the podcast um, a while back and they were saying how there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of different bits of paper and it was this question about is a risk averse culture actually worthwhile overall if you stop that one in 1000 from having i don't know a fall but the, yeah. the the cost on the system is that there's no time for anything um is it worth it um so yeah yeah i mean the other thing it's doing is it's really affecting the quality of care i mean one of the key tenets of healthcare is that health professionals are providing care to to a patient or a, or a consumer and you know, once they get so busy that all they can do is processes and they don't have time, they're not able to actually provide that one-on-one -on -one caring provision of care that that's really the tenet of what healthcare is all about. So it completely breaks that whole, you know, doctor-patient or nurse-patient relationship. I mean, we're finding in EDs at the moment that um, the nurses are so busy that they end up very process-oriented. So, so um, within a complex system... So a very, very busy, complex system, you're much better to use goal-oriented processes. So where you say, okay, the goal is to do this. So in this case, perhaps care for the patient. And how you do that, you're able to flex depending on the situation you find yourself in and the needs of that patient to provide the best care that you're able for that patient. Um, a process-oriented system is more like what we're seeing in healthcare with all the guidelines that says, well, we're not going to worry about the goal. We're going to assume that, you know, we've decided on the goal. This is how you get there. And you have to follow these individual steps. And you see it in things like checklists. You see it in things like guidelines where there's no flexibility. You just have to follow the list of steps. So when people start following steps, <laughs> they lose sight of the big picture and they lose sight of that whole care interaction. And we're finding in EDs that um, 
they're just following processes. And a lot of the processes are around the IT systems and the information systems. So they're spending more time on the computer, you know, like ticking boxes and making sure that all these things have been complied with and very little time actually providing that holistic patient care. And it's not just affecting the patient, it's also affecting the healthcare professional. You know, they're getting burnt out. Mm -hmm. um, they're not having joy in work. Um, they're worried about, you know, um, why did I get into this? You know, it's not providing the sorts of, you know, value that I, th things that I value in my life. You know, I want, I got into this because I care for people and that's what I want to do. And I was spending all my time on a computer.